to our story about the Hardy Girls. This is Jane Mill and I'm Kathy Mutarera. And in parts of our story, we will be portraying real life Hardy Girls named Opal and Francis. We are wearing replicas of Hardy Girl uniforms from different eras. Uh, Jane's is a little more modern than mine. Uh, they always wore black and white, usually black with the white apron and almost always with the little ribbon kind of accent. Sometimes in the summer they would have a white, all white uniform, but we'll give you a look. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Our, our aprons are made for us especially by a friend named Kathy White, and we appreciate having something that makes it exactly look like an Army Girl uniform. So, our story begins with a part in Pueblo. Back in the 1870s, when the railroads were opening up the West, trains were the most efficient means of long distance transportation being both quicker and more comfortable than bouncing along in a wagon or a stagecoach. But the real trial on a train trip of any length was to get a decent meal. There were no food service items at all on the train, so you had two options as a passenger. One was to pack as much food as you could and hope that it didn't spoil before you got to your destination. Second option was to wait until the train made a stop. They made lots of little 15, 20 minute stops. Jump off the train and try to get fed at a little eatery near the depot. The prices were outrageous. And the customers described the food in words like, Greasy, tough, stale, dry, and even rancid. Uh, favorite menu items were things like biscuits, so heavy they were nicknamed sinkers. <laughs> and my favorite, prairie dog stew. <laughs> In addition, you had the conniving food sellers who would take the money in advance for the food and serve it very slowly so that as you were spooning your stew, the train whistle blew to say they were leaving and you ran off while the food service people gathered up the stew and put it back in the pot for the next train load. Yes. Well, in 1876, the Santa Fe Railroad completed their track from Topeka, Kansas to Pueblo, and they wanted to celebrate. So in March of that year, they arranged for two special excursion trains that would carry 400 dignitaries and other sightseers from Topeka to Pueblo. The train trip was planned to take a day and a half, and they would stop one place in Kansas and get off for a meal. And other than that, they would bring their food. Well, it was springtime and close to the Rockies, and there was a huge blizzard which covered the tracks and slowed or even stopped the train. So the train trip took two and a half days, and pretty soon every crumb had been eaten. By the time those people got to Pueblo, they were very glad to be here. But they were exhausted and starving. Fortunately for them, all 400 were taken in by the kindly people of Pueblo and fed and given a chance to rest. The lesson from all that for the Santa Fe Railroad was that you better feed your passengers. Our story really begins in 1835 when a man by the name of Fred Harvey was born. He immigrated to the United States as a 15-year-old in 1850. His first job was a $2 a week busboy and pot walloper or dishwasher. He then took a job on the uh, 
Burlington, Illinois Railroad as a mail clerk. And he got to experience this food that we've just heard about, including the prairie dog stew. And he said, you know, I can make a difference. People don't have to eat that kind of food. He partnered with a friend. They went down to St. Louis and opened up a cafe. Everything was going really well until the friend stole from him, leaving him quite destitute. But being determined as he was, he opened up two other cafes in Wallace, Kansas, in Hugo, Colorado. And then he went to the Burlington Quincy Railroad and offered them a whole new standard for food service. But they turned him down. Fortunately for him, they sent him to the newly forming Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. And they thought it was a marvelous idea, and on a handshake, they gave him a 10-year exclusive contract. So the first lunch counter opened up in Topeka, Kansas. And from there, more and more lunch counters, cafes, restaurants, about every 100 miles along the Santa Fe Railroad line. And then these were to be later called Harvey Houses. His vision was, and hard work, put this whole thing on, a, on a, an amazing uh, perspective and, and uh, was fine. Uh, so his, his standards were so amazing. Uh, the floors were to be scrubbed and spotless. Silver was to be polished. The finest of table linens were to be used. And the freshest of products like produce and meat products were to be uh, served, all at reasonable prices. His life, however, had a great deal of hardship. As a young person, he contracted yellow fever. Then he got typhoid fever. His first little wife, after giving birth to the second son, died of complications from the pregnancy. And then, if that wasn't enough, both of those little boys died of scarlet fever. He remarried. And they had five children, two boys, the older boy, uh, two boys and three girls, the older boy, Ford, and the younger boy, Byron. As bouts of typhoid began to really take a toll on Fred's life, Ford stepped up and took more and more responsibilities for the company. Fred passed away in 1901. But due to the dedication of those two boys, the company went on for a number of years, well into the 1960s. And now, let's hear about uh, how the Harvey Girls got started. When, when Fred Harvey opened his lunch counters in Kansas, he used local women as waitresses. But as the railroad moved further west, and there were fewer towns and fewer women, they switched to using all men to serve the food. This went on for a while until an incident in the Harvey House in Raton, New Mexico. All of the wait staff had an evening of drinking and brawling, <laughs> and no one was at all able to serve food the next day. When Fred Harvey heard about this, Changes were to be made. So in 1883, they decided to hire women, and Fred Harvey was very particular about how that was going to go. Partly because waitresses at that time did not have the greatest reputation. They were thought to be sort of coarse and loose, maybe even soiled doves. So Fred just erased all that and invented a whole new professional food server called a Harvey Girl. These were to be women, single, only, only single women between the ages of 18 and 30 as they applied. Only those women could apply. They were 
were interviewed to make sure that they were intelligent, attractive, well-mannered, and of good character. In addition, they had a one or two month trial period just to make sure that they worked out on the job and they were trained during that time. Then they wanted to, to guarantee to the families and the public at large that everything was really respectable. Every young woman, woman would live in a dormitory, have a strict curfew, and be supervised by a live-in house mother. And so they wanted to attract a lot of women from all over the country to apply. They did that by offering what was a great salary for women at that time, $17.50 a month. <laughs> Plus, you got room and board and you could keep all your tips. So that was appealing. In addition, every woman who finished a contract period, which was either six months or a year, got a free pass to go anywhere that the Santa Fe Railroad went. So it was pretty appealing. And women from all over the country applied. They were, they were from east coast big cities, from Midwest small towns. Uh, women left their farm families. Some of them left jobs as teachers, secretaries, salesgirls, and factory workers. Now the reasons they left and came to Harvey had to do with often financial need. There were many, especially during later during the Depression, who were sending money home to desperate families. Some wanted adventure and travel, and they got that very well. Some were interested in finding a husband, and that also worked out very well. Because out west, the cowboys and railroaders and other men outnumbered the women two to one, so that the Harvey system became a great matchmaking institution, and Fred Harvey was nicknamed the Cupid of the West. <laughs> and now we're going to hear the story of one particular Harvey girl, Opal Sell. Hello there. Yes, I'm Opal. I come from a West Texas family. Uh, you know the land of sand and sage and prairie dogs? As my two older brothers and sisters left home, uh, I stayed back to take care of my invalid mother. I stayed home until my mother passed away in 1919. And then um, my well-to-do uncle said, can you still hear me? My well-to-do uncle decided to send me to secretarial business school. Now, I was considered to be a well-educated 24-year-old girl, um, rather attractive, and um, apparently my boss felt the same thing and tried to take advantage of me, and I quit. Didn't want any part of that. But what was I going to do? I needed a job. The uh, Harvey system was hiring down in, in Amarillo, Texas. So I decided to apply. I have to smile when I think about that interview. The fellow said to me, you know, you're the first girl this morning I've interviewed who isn't chewing gum. You must be our kind of people. <laughs> and I was practically hired on the spot. Well, I was a little nervous, of course, and uh, the morning of my training, I was standing at the lunch counter with my trainer, and a little mouse ran out on the top of the, the counter, up the sleeve of my dress. I screamed and jumped up on the counter, just as my manager was coming in. <laughs> and I thought, oh my, this could be my first and last day. But they convinced me to stay, which I did. From time to time, celebrities would ride the rails, uh, Hollywood stars and other dignitaries. And this particular cowboy that came often uh, did the most amazing rope tricks. And I uh, really, every chance I got, I tried to, to, to get out and see what he was doing. And it just so happened that I was the Harvey girl that he always wanted to serve him 
in the dining room, and I always knew what he wanted, cornbread and beans and delicious ham and eggs. It just so happened that that cowboy's name was Will Rogers. Another memory was uh, Hutchinson, Kansas, Ju uh, July of 1928, floods. We were living across the street in our dorm from the Basanti Hotel, and we were wondering how we were going to get over there to work. We figured there was only one way, and that was probably on the back of some strong man. So we went, got our things gathered up, and rode on piggyback across and had to spend several days uh, at the hotel before we could back, get back to the dorm. Now let's hear about another Harvey girl named Frances Hansen. Hi, I'm Frances. I'm from Texas too, a little town called Granville Gap. When I graduated from high school, yay class of 1935, I took myself a short way to Dallas and enrolled in the Field Beauty School. I, in my training, passed my boards and went to work in a salon. But times were tough and 50 cents for a shampoo and set just didn't go very far. And I was even sharing an apartment with four other girls and still couldn't get by on the money that my dad, without the money that my dad sent me. So when my cousin Val Swenson wrote me a letter, I paid close attention. She was working in a Harvey house in Arizona and I liked what she had to say about life there. So I wrote to Kansas City and told them I was interested and they said, you've got a job. Here's a ticket to Kingman, Arizona, and they even included the meals. I was ready to go. But my mom and dad were not excited about the prospect and me going so far away. But I reassured them and told them I could come back in six months for free if I didn't like it. And I'd always wanted to travel and see new places. So I packed my bag and got on the train. Now, Kingman, Arizona is in the northern part of Arizona, and I got there in May, and it snowed. <laughs> Only the second time in my life I'd ever seen snow. After that welcome, I had two or three weeks of instruction from the head waitress about how to do things there. And then I was sent on to my permanent assignment at Seligman, which was between Kingman and Flagstaff. Now, in Seligman, most of the local customers at the Harvey House were railroaders, and they liked to tease the new girls, especially ones that had Texas accents like I had then. But I learned to just give it back as good as I got, and the teasing was fun. And the bosses at Harvey are always very careful to make sure that nobody gets out of line. In Seligman, we got to join in in the hometown activities like dances at the high school gym, movies, hiking, occasionally a rodeo. But my favorite experience there was when if we could get a ride, we would go out to where the cowboys were guarding the cattle that were waiting to be shipped on the railroad. There'd be a fire and some food and music and dancing. And I met a handsome cowboy named Van Cosby. And he had a Texas accent and could dance the Texas two step. I might mention about Opal that she stayed on with the Harvey Company for 45 years, made it her career. She was promoted to head waitress and trained many a young woman in the Harvey way until she retired at age 69. Frances uh, did marry Sam, and they had two boys, Rick and Roger, and he signed on with the railroad and they moved to uh, uh, quite a bit around Arizona and California. 
However, in her later years, she moved to Canyon City, Colorado, and she passed away as recently as 2012. Now, let's look in on uh, Opal as she is training Francis. Hi, Francis. Hi. My name is Opal. And we are going to get quite well acquainted here. We will be together quite a bit for these next uh, two months. I uh, wanted to start with something we call the Harvey Way. It's kind of a set of guidelines that I'd like you to look at from time to time. But just to highlight them, uh, we chose you as a Harvey girl because we felt that you liked people and you would be uh, ready and willing to help uh, travelers because, you know, by the time you see them and they've gotten off the train, uh, they may be tired and we know they're hungry and they just may need a kind word or two. So just look at this from time to time. Uh, another set of rules will be posted on your dorm uh, wall and if you or your roommate have a question, you can ask your dorm mom about that. Now I see you have on your black and white uniform. Uh, now, remember that the hemline cannot be more than eight inches off the floor. Uh, now, if you were to get a spot, a soil, on, on your uniform, uh, you would need to take care of that right away. How would I manage that? The company has, will have issued you uh, laundered uh, uh, uniforms, but you are supposed to starch and iron them, and you'd need to change that very quickly. Right. Yes. And uh, also opaque, opaque black stockings and sturdy black shoes. And remember, no jewelry, no makeup, and no chewing gum. <laughs> now, let's, let's talk, talk about um, the passenger on the train for the moment. They will have filled out a menu request, and that will have been telegraphed to the upcoming stop. And a mile before reaching that stop, the whistle will blow, and that's your signal to go to your station to be ready to serve the customers. Now, keeping in mind that from the time they get off the train until they get back on, they have just 30 minutes. So everything has to work very smoothly like uh, clockwork. Now, when you get to your station, you will place a, a glass of cold water by each place. You will have a plate with three pats of butter, each with the, the mark of a fork tine on them to show that no fingers have touched the, the butter. And also, there will be either a fresh fruit salad or a fresh vegetable salad at each of the places. Then when the uh, passengers come in, you will ask them what they have ordered and that information is sent to the kitchen. And then you ask them what they would like to drink. Can I write that down? No, we have something called a cup code and let me show you how that works. If the passenger wants hot coffee, the cup is left in the saucer like so. If the passenger wants hot tea, the cup is turned over and left in the saucer. If the customer wants iced tea, the cup is placed at this angle on the saucer. And if they want milk, the cup is removed from the saucer and placed upright. And the drink girls will come and fill that order. Wow, that's a lot to remember. Aren't you glad when the train goes out and you have a little time to relax? Well, yes, but keep in mind we have rules for that too. You are not to sit down at any time during your shift. And you are not to talk to another Harvey girl. You may talk to the passengers, but not to each other. So those are, those are things that we definitely have to abide by. You know, I hear the whistle. Let's go to our stations and be ready. Harvey girls work six or seven days a week, usually on a 
Harvey houses had weekly socials for the employees and sometimes invited locals also. Now there was a Harvey policy that said that employees could not date each other, but managers often overlooked that, especially when they were in isolated areas where there wasn't anybody else. In addition, the dormitory system gave the girls a, a built-in support. They helped each other, looked out for younger girls, and also made lifelong friendships. In their free time together, they play games, sing, have picnics, if they were lucky, go shopping. And as you've heard, sometimes they got to wait on celebrities who were going back and forth from Hollywood. One of their perks, as we mentioned, is the chance, when they finish their contract period, to travel anywhere to see the Santa Fe, anywhere where the Santa Fe went and see enchanting parts of America. So they were pretty happy. But one thing they really liked to do when they were off duty was to sit down. <laughs> Did you ever work at the uh, Grand Canyon, Francis? Yes, I did a few times. They used to send us there from Seligman when they needed extra help. Uh, beautiful restaurant there called El Cobar, which was nice to look at. And I would see the cars and buses that they used for Harvey tours that went to the Indian Pueblos and places like the Painted Desert. And I would talk with the college girls and the drivers who were on the, on the tours. Uh -huh. Well, I knew uh, Berta Parker, and she married one of those drivers. Uh, she came from Oklahoma and grew up in a log cabin. She married uh, the driver, and I understand they worked. They lived on the, the rim of the Grand Canyon and worked very hard, and they now have a very successful trucking business. Well, they did well. Yeah. Did you ever work with uh, any of the Klein girls? There was, um, I worked with Mary from Kansas and her sister, Johanna. Uh, jo, it was before Jo went to nursing school and she used to say that nursing school, nursing itself was easy after working at Harvey. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well I knew Kate Klein. Uh, her first husband died of pneumonia and I worked with her after that. She was one of those Harvey girls that could go home during the harvest time and help put up the crops. Well, those, those fine girls lived on a farm that their dad bought by working for the, for the Santa Fe Railroad. Do you know that every one of those six Klein girls, when they finished their education at eighth grade, went to work at the Harvey girls? Mm, my goodness. Do you remember Josephine Steinlinker from Germany? Oh my goodness, she was a hard working gal. She married one of the chefs and had a, a daughter and then he died. But she, she was uh, named a manager right off and, and worked in about eight different states. And she saved enough money that she could send her daughter through college. Impressive. Mm -hmm. You know, Harvey was a pretty good organization for women often. Did you ever hear of Mary Coulter, the first, the first oh, lady yes. architect I ever knew of? Yes. She designed a couple of buildings at the Grand Canyon and almost all of the Harvey houses in the Southwest and did the interior decoration. She was one of the first to use Indian and Mexican themes in the buildings. And did you ever see uh, La Posada? La Posada, the resting place. Winslow, Arizona. What a spot. She was an amazing lady. There were 70 guest rooms in the hotel. There was a, a, a lunch counter that seated 120 people. The turquoise dining room was just so elegant. She was really ahead of her time, but I understand she was a bit feisty and a little hard to deal with at times, too. I bet she kind of had to be. Yeah. I think so. Well, the Harvey Company promoted tourism in the Southwest. They used advertisements, books. They were among the first to use the picture postcards. They had impressive displays at the World's Fair in Chicago and later in San Francisco with native artisans 
automobile came along and changed the way that people traveled in America, that made a great difference, as well as the Depression, which pretty much dried up tourism. The Harvey system had a big spurt during each world war because they fed the troops that were crossing America on the trains, either with a big mess hall style meal or with box lunches that they sent on the trains. And I think maybe a few of those soldiers met Harvey girls too. But in general, things got pretty dim for railroad tourism after coast to coast airline flights came in. So in about the 1950s, the Harvey girls started to disappear. And in 1968, the company was sold. The Fred Harvey Organization really has quite a spot in American history, beginning in the 1870s and extending into the 1960s, just about 90 years. It was the first American restaurant food chain, establishing these eating places along the Santa Fe line, a hundred or more of them. It offered job opportunities to over 100,000 women during the history of that company. These were women that were really dedicated to the company and wanting to be there for the passengers. This often led to further education and other future jobs. About 20,000 of them married railroad men, cowboys, ranchers, and we're told that about 4,000 little baby boys born during this time were named either Fred or Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> the company is no longer, but we could still enjoy memories and stay in hotels that remind us of this. The La, the La Fonda in, in Santa Fe, the La Posada in Winslow, just to name two of them. And now, and, and, and this is a, a great uh, piece of American history, a symbol of a special era. And now we're going to ask you to help us end our program you have and can share a chorus to a song. We will sing it for you first and you can join us as, as you, and we expect some good singing now. Yes. That this song comes from a poem that was written by uh, a Harvey customer about his favorite Harvey girl. And it was put to music by Nell Mills, and we appreciate his work. A charming sort of a gal, over coffee she's a pal, a special kind of girl, she surely is a pearl, all dressed in spotless linen, her hair long in a curl, so purely sweetly winning is a happy Harvey girl. One crisp December morn, chilly was the day. I sat behind my coffee in a Harvey House Cafe. Fred's coffee is a nectar, a beverage supreme. And the girl who serves it adds glamour to my dream. Oh, a charming sort of a gal, over coffee she's a pal. A special kind of girl, she surely is a pearl. All dressed in spotless linen, her hair all in a curl. So purely, sweetly winning, is a happy Harvey girl. The aroma so enticing, blending with the steam. The face behind the hazy cup, adds glamour to my dream. I like my morning coffee before the busy noon. When she has time to chatter, and I dally with my spoon. Oh, a charming sort of a gal, 
over coffee, she's a pro, a special kind of girl. She sure is a pearl, all dressed in spotless linen, her hair all in a curl, so purely, sweetly,